I am currently the CIO at the University of Texas at Brownsville, which is uh, the southernmost component of the University of Texas system. We are as far south in Texas practically as you can get. Today, I'm going to talk about Federated Identity Management 101. And so what I'm trying to do today is give you a, is the background for you to be able to uh, go out and find things about identity management, in particular Federated Identity Management. Um, and I'll try to outline some of the resources and give you the background for it. Um, my unindicted co-conspirator today is Paul Kasky, who isn't there in the room with you yet. I assume he is racing from the airport in some conveyance trying to get there at the moment. I wonder which way this goes. Today I'm going to show you a couple of things. I'm going to start by giving you a demonstration and then uh, in classic uh, college freshman uh, approach to lecture, I'll give you some basics, talk about why institutions, at least in higher ed, want to participate. I'll talk about I'll, just a little bit about traditional identity management versus federated identity management. Um, talk about what's necessary to put a federation together. I will compare a couple of real federations for you and uh, let you uh, make up your mind about what kinds of things appeal to you. Then I will get to the, the crux of the matter in some ways. And what we're trying to do here, and people normally do not understand this until they've worked in it for a while, is we're actually trying to automate trust. And if you think about that for a minute, that is a very um, complex thing. It is not simply a matter of, matter of technology. Uh, trust in how we do business in society is based upon business relationships, personal relationships, many other things. So how do we how do we do that? And then finally, if you're you're so inspired today that you want to go out and skip the Internet 2 conference and build your own federation, then we have a roadmap for you to go do that. I'm going to give you a couple of examples just to uh, try to motivate you here. Um, I am now at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston, and let me pop this up so that it's a little bit more readable. And it says if you want to log into Blackboard, um, you can do so through, th through the Federation. It says to select your home institution. And my home institution, for the purposes of this discussion, um, is going to be the University of Texas system, since I am currently working for both of them. And you see there's other institutions listed there. Once I get um, what it does now is it asks, it sips me back to the University of Texas system and asks me uh, for my logon ID. Which is C. Goldsmith. And then it asks me for my snack. And the reason it asks for a snack, that's this, the um, system network access credential. Um, I hate to say this, but the reason they call it a snack is because in the identity management world, um, this is generally known, 
applications such as Blackboard here are uh, spoken of as consuming credentials. So we created the snack credential to be consumed. Um, sorry about that. The, um, this is Blackboard at the University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio. The courses that I've enrolled in are Blackboard uh, Shibboleth uh, authorization. Uh, this is you can see that it's actually there, although it's not really uh, very interesting. It's just a matter of showing that we can actually do that with um, Blackboard. And if I go back now to my slides, I'm going to kill the slides off. Now notice I was logged in to the Health Science Center Houston. Um, now what I'm going to do is go log on to a SharePoint system at system. And what just happened? Well, I didn't have to log on again. One of the other things that Federated Identity Management does for you is it gives you single sign-on, or if not single sign-on, reduced sign-on. So if you look, and I should have pointed it out earlier, but the credential up here, or the URL up here earlier, uh, pointed to the Texas Medical Center at, in Houston. This is now pointing at UT System. And so this gives you the possibility of a lot of interesting things. You can, in fact, create a portal uh, for students, a portal for faculty, whatever, where none of the applications are local. And once you log on, you never have to log on to any of them again, he said, hopefully. So now we'll get go back and look. Now that you're thoroughly motivated, right, um, I will go back and talk a little bit about uh, the definitions. Identity management means different things to different, different people in this field. If you click on this one, this one will take you away to um, the wiki page and talks about um, identity management. And it says the article may be too technical for most readers to understand. Well, that's just the arrogance of people in this field. Uh, the stuff is not hard to understand, but it is as detailed and as um, tedious, if you will, as all uh, computer programming is. And so um, I don't think tedious, I don't think um, compl complex is exactly, too technical is exactly the right word. In fact, it's a unique intersection of technology and uh, policy. And we'll spend a lot more time on that. I call it the life cycle of an identity. And that's not very helpful to you unless you know what an identity is. Well, an identity is a label or a name. My name is Claire Goldsmith, and that is an identity. Uh, I like to keep it simple and say that's all that an identity is. It's just a name. However, in point of fact, a name may have attributes associated with it, and these can include all sorts of things. Your address, your telephone number, your height, your weight, what courses you're taking, taking if you have a master's in education. All those things are attributes, and the more attributes you pile up, the more certain we are that that name is actually associated with a specific individual. Identity is owned by somebody. I like to think that I own my identity, Claire Goldsmith. Another identity for me, by the way, is my social security number. And uh, ah, the famous Mr. Caskey has arrived. Congratulations, Paul. And we are to authentication. We're all the way to the fourth slide. Um, 
Authentication is an interesting tack, and I won't spend a lot of time on it in this talk, but you certainly can. Um, there are religious wars fought over it within the identity management field. Authentication is the verification of identity owner. In other words, if my name is Claire Goldsmith, how do you all know that? Well, I told you, but am I trustworthy? Can you believe me? Well, if I happen to have uh, my birth certificate with me and can show it to you, then you are much likelier to believe me. Uh, if I have a driver's license that has a photo ID and you believe that whatever state that issued it required seeing my, driver, my birth certificate, you may also believe my driver's license. But anyway, that's what authentication is. It's a, <clears throat> and we have actually measures of how certain the verif we are of the verification. And then finally, the other aspect uh, is authorization. Okay, I'm Claire Goldsmith. I work for the University of Texas at Brownsville. What am I authorized to do in that context? The authorization shows the capabilities that I have within my a particular context. And as you're all well aware, we all have multiple contexts, whether that's the place of employment um, or volunteerism, the context of Internet, too, may be a, a substantial one. And this is now about all you need to know about a federated identity management. This is all the components of it. It's really fairly elegant, which is why it becomes, um, well, a little interesting to completely understand. If you stop and think about this, you have somebody called the federation operator. You have a service provider, and this is the resource that I want to use. We have an identity provider, which is the um, identity that is going to try to access the service. Realizing that these three entities, uh, these three components of federated identity management can be at one institution or they can be at three institutions, or they could be spread over several institutions is where the elegance comes from and how we get this, how we make use of this fairly simple concept in a very powerful way. In case of in common, which is operated by Internet 2, that is the Federation for Higher Education in the United States. Typically, someone like Elsevier is thought of as a, you know, content provider, intellectual property, databases, and so on. And um, Texas A&M is the university I'm showing here just for uh, argument's sake. And, and a student, faculty member, staff member at TAMU might want to access Elsevier service and basically what the in commons function is to make the bridge between the two. This is an automation of trust uh, on a simple level where Elsevier is taking uh, Texas A&M's word that a student is a student. However, this can become more complicated because if we look at other entities that might participate in InCommon, we could look at Penn State and Texas A&M, and both could be service providers and both could be identity providers, particularly if this was an, a, a situation where they were sharing classes and there were students at one institution taking classes at the other and vice versa. Both entities would be uh, asserting the identities and both entities would be providing the services.